After the end of the War of 1812, there was a burst of national unity and patriotism, and this unity really boosted the Republican Party and pretty much destroyed what was left of the Federalist Party. And uh, this, the Federalist Party pretty much disappeared after its dismal showing in the 1816 election. Now, Americans, for the most part, largely welcomed the end of all this partisan squabbles and all this factionalism. And uh, in this period of history, uh, Americans embraced this new spirit of unity, and uh, this period became known as the era of good feelings. Now, what we see happening in this period is that a lot of these Republicans who had formerly been war hawks, now they became economic nationalists. Uh, they believe very strongly that uh, the ideas of Hamilton could be used to achieve the ideas of Jefferson. Remember, Jefferson had believed that America was destined to be an empire of liberty, stretching from sea to sea, a nation of farmers uh, going all the way across the continent. And the, these new economic nationalists believed that, that a stronger federal government could be used to promote trade and industry so that the United States would have both the financial and the military resources it needed so that it could expand its borders and advance to the Pacific. So with the Republican Party adopting much of the ideas of Hamilton, his economic ideas anyway, all of a sudden the Republicans won over what was left of those Federalists left in New England uh, and, and businessmen up in New England, and they all came out in support of the Republican Party. Um, in, in 1816, uh, President Monroe won his first term, and then in 1820, he, he ran largely unopposed and was swept into office for a second term. In this, ex in this lesson, in this examination, we're going to look at, all, look at, first of all, the transformation of these former war hawks into economic nationalists and talk about what that means. Uh, second of all, we're going to look at the presidency of James Monroe and look at his successful efforts to expand this nation's borders to the Pacific. So first of all, let's talk about economic nationalists. And now, uh, following the War of 1812, the two most prominent uh, economic nationalists were the former war hawks, uh, Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. A and they believed uh, that, and they still very strongly believed in the principles of Jefferson's Republican Party. That did not change. But they believed that maybe some of Hamilton's ideas about the economy were necessary so that the country uh, would be stronger. They believed that the, strong, the nation needed a, a stronger federal government that could promote trade and industry and also a, na a stronger national defense so that the United States would have the respect of European nations and be able to expand westward to the Pacific. So what we see happening in the years following the War of 1812 is that these economic nationalists proposed ideas that had been previously advocated by Federalists. <coughs> Now, one thing that the Republicans believed now, following the War of 1812, was that uh, state militias were not effective for national defense or for military action. So in 1815, Congress, and these are Republicans who ran Congress, they voted to vastly expand the United States Army, back, get it back up to 10,000 men level. They also voted to start rebuilding up the nation's navy and building new naval warships. Also, Congress did something that they had not done before. They actually passed a tariff, the, the Tariff of 1816. Now, what this tariff did was to place a tax of between 20 and 25 percent on certain foreign imports. Now, the purpose of a tariff is to raise prices on certain foreign imports so that American consumers, instead of buying these foreign imports, will instead buy these goods that were produced right here in the United States. So the idea was that the tariff would, would thus promote the sale. It would boost the sale of American goods and, th and therefore promote those particular industries. Now, this is what we call a protective tariff, the idea being that the tariff protects certain domestic industries from foreign competition and allows those industries to grow and expand. And you have to remember that this idea had first been proposed by Hamilton back in, in 1792. In 1816, Congress did something else that Hamilton had advocated. They, they, Congress passed and created the second bank of the United States. Now, it had the exact same design 
as the first bank of the United States that had been put forward back in 1791 by Alexander Hamilton. And the bank, this new bank, the second bank of the United States, was to function just like the earlier bank. Um, it was to uh, promote uh, industry and, and provide uh, credit for the United States of America. Um, you see, Republicans, when they look back at the War of 1812, they saw that one of the problems the country faced was that they didn't have any source of credit. They had no financial security. And the second bank of the United States was created to provide that financial security for the country. Now, early in 1817, Congress passed another bill. It's called the Bonus Bill. And this bill was proposed by John C. Calhoun. Now, what this bonus bill would have done is it would have used the profits or the dividends from the Bank of the United States uh, and, and released those funds for the, constructions, the construction of roads and canals in the states. Now, this is what we call internal improvements, the use of federal money to build roads and canals in the states. Um, remember, Hamilton had proposed this idea back in 1792, this idea of using federal funds to, for road and canal construction. Now, in the early 1817, James Madison was the outgoing president. He was still the active president. And one of, the last, one of his last acts in, in office was to veto this bill. And he vetoed this bill because he did not think that the United States Constitution gave the federal government the authority to fund internal improvements. And the, the Congress did not have enough votes to override his veto, and, and the veto stood. Um, but despite the failure of this particular bill, the idea of federal funding for internal improvements still continued to have strong support among many Republicans, despite the president's um, the rejection of it. Now, the, the proposals of the Republicans, these ideas that Republicans were putting forth and getting passed in Congress between 1815 and 1817, um, this, these proposals had the support of many Federalists, uh, many Federalists who were wealthy businessmen and merchants in New England who had traditionally voted Federalist. Now they had no reason to be Federalist because the Republican Party was embracing um, policies that they had embraced for, for years. So this further led to the complete collapse and demise of the Federalist Party. Now, in the election of 1816, the Republican candidate was James Monroe of Virginia. And he won in a landslide. The, the Federalist candidate was a man by the name of Rufus King. He was a senator from New York. And just to give you an idea of this landslide, uh, the vote was 183 electoral votes for Monroe to just 34 for King. Now, so Monroe was elected by a landslide. Now, Monroe was a Revolutionary War veteran. He had been involved in the American government for, for decades. For many Americans, he was a unifying figure. He was part of this new era of good feeling because he, he came to symbolize for many Americas for many Americans, the spirit of 1776. He was one of the great generation, the greatest generation of founding fathers who had made this country possible. So he, he was a, a hero among many Americans. Now, when Monroe became president, in 18, by the time he took the oath of office in 1817, he wanted to show the country that the old days of factionalism and partisanship were long gone. So one of his first acts in office was to appoint as his new Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. Now, John Quincy Adams was the son of John Adams. John Quincy Adams was a former Federalist. Now, choosing Quincy Adams, John Quincy Adams as his Secretary of State was very symbolic because up to that point, presidents had always uh, appointed a Secretary of State who they were going to endorse later as their successor. You know, Madison had been Jefferson's Secretary of State. Monroe had been Madison's Secretary of State. So and essentially what Monroe was saying by appointing John Quincy Adams was that this is the man that I'm endorsing as my president, as my successor, as the next president. And that was, that was something that brought former Federalists into the Republican fold. Now, John Quincy Adams was not just a good choice politically. He was a good choice because he was considered widely by historians to be America's greatest Secretary of State. The man was a genius. You know, when he was 13, he could already speak five different languages. I mean, he was a, 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 a IQ, unbelievable, probably the smartest president we've ever had. Now, when he was president, he negotiated a series of treaties with foreign governments 
that were very important in expanding the territory of this country, which, remember, was one of the primary goals of economic nationalists. Now, in 1817 and 1818, first of all, he worked out a deal with Great Britain. Remember, under the terms of the Treaty of Ghent that had ended the War of 1812, uh, both sides were to have these joint commissions. So the two sides met, and they had a commission, and, it, and what they came up with was known as the Convention of 1818. Now, what this Convention of 1818 decision do was to establish a border between British Canada and the United States that extended from the Great Lakes in the east all the way to the Rocky Mountains. It's the, the 49th parallel. Uh, another part of this convention was that the two countries decided to share ownership of the Oregon Territory. So uh, this, this would be uh, jointly occupied by North, by, by both countries, and they would determine an exact border uh, at a later date. So, so by the uh, terms of this treaty, now the United States borders all stretched and extended all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Um, now, remember the Lewis and Clark expedition of 1804 and 1806 had been the first to reach the Pacific and had been the basis of America's claim to the Oregon Territory. And now Great Britain, by this Convention of 1818, formally recognized America's right to the Oregon Territory and America's extension of territory to the Pacific Ocean. Now, another achievement of John Quincy Adams and the Monroe administration was the acquisition of Florida uh, in 1819. First, to give you some background. Um, Florida was controlled by Spain, and the Spanish government had very little control over Florida. And in fact, Creek and Seminole Indians were using Florida as a base to mount attacks uh, on Americans in places like Georgia and Alabama. And then they were fleeing back into Florida and using Florida as a, as a base, as a haven. At the same time, runaway slaves from across the South were making their way to Florida and living there in their own communities. Um, so this was a concern, especially to Southerners, to have all these runaway slaves living in Florida. Now, in 1818, John C. Calhoun, who happened to be Secretary of War at the time, he uh, ordered Andrew Jackson, who was a, still a, a general in the United States Army, uh, he told Gen uh, General Jackson to, to march into Florida and to mount a punitive campaign against the Creek and Seminoles, just to basically teach them a lesson. Now, Andrew Jackson did more than that. He, not only did he attack the Creeks and the Seminoles, but he went ahead and occupied all of Spanish Florida. Now, the Spanish, of course, were very angry at this, and they, um, they demanded that the United States forces withdraw and that General Jackson be punished. But Adams didn't do that. Instead, Adams said, look, you, we already have Florida. Now it's time for you to negotiate. And so what happened is that Spain and the United States ended up negotiating a deal. And uh, this treaty signed between the United States and Spain is known as the adams onis Treaty. It's also known as the Transcontinental Treaty. Now, under this treaty, Spain ceded all of Florida uh, to the United States. They also gave up any claims to the Oregon Territory. That would be all territory north of what is today California. Now, the United States also agreed to give up some things. They agreed to give up their claim to the Gulf Coast of Texas, which was part, had been part of the Louisiana Purchase. Now, like the Convention of 1818, what this treaty did was to establish a border between the United States and, and, and Spanish territories that extended all the way to the Pacific Ocean, from Texas to the Pacific. So now, two countries, Spain and Great Britain, recognized that the United States extended all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now, another achievement of Adams and President Monroe was in 18, 1823 with the Monroe Doctrine. Now, what was the Monroe Doctrine? What's the background here? Well, you see, by, by 1823, Russia was expanding. Russia had already jumped from Siberia into Alaska, and Russia had extended trading posts all the way as far south as California. Um, Meanwhile, at the same time, Spain uh, had formed an alliance with other conservative European mar 
monarchies, including Russia, but also France and Austria and Prussia. And uh, Spain was attempting to crush the, the newly independent republics that had, had arisen uh, in Latin America. So given this situation, James Monroe and John Quincy Adams issued a statement, the Monroe Doctrine. And basically what the Monroe Doctrine stated was that the entire Western Hemisphere was no longer open to any further colonization by any European power. Um, and basically the United States was asserting that the United States was the hegemonic or dominant power in the entire Western Hemisphere and was therefore the guardian of the independence and sovereignty of all these new nations that had just been formed in Latin America. Now this Monroe Doctrine was not recognized by the European powers, but it did serve to strengthen the idea and to legitimize further territorial expansion by the United States. Uh, the, the notion of manifest destiny that we'll look at in a later lesson also came out of this idea, this idea of continual Western expansion. Um, another important, another importance of this doctrine was it reinforced an idea that had been put forward by George Washington. Uh, George Washington in his farewell address to the nation in 1797 had basically told the, his fellow Americans that this to not get involved in Europe. And what the Monroe Doctrine was saying was that the United States was going to be only focused here in the Western Hemisphere and had really no interest in what was going on anywhere else. And that Basically, the Western Hemisphere was essentially America's backyard. <clears throat> now, by the time that the Monroe Doctrine was issued in 1823, all the unity and patriotism that had not united the country had all but disappeared. And the country was moving more and more into sectional uh, differences and unrest. Uh, in the next lesson, we're going to examine those factors which resulted in America's unity disappearing.